both of you have supported the judgment and professor bakshi has rightly said that don't expect too much from this uh, fine tuning exercise the judges have said no radical change that's reported also in the media so i am giving you a fact situation because so much of this judgment of these judgments are based on empirical knowledge of the judges about how certain law ministers pushed appointments etc now both of you <coughs> don't practice but both of you have sufficient exposure to courts in your activist roles now here is a collegium of three judges let us say and the fact is that the profession is hereditary and dynastic we can't wish that away professor bakshi you've lived long enough in delhi to understand me when i say that this phenomenon of sada damad twadi bahu i hope you get what i am saying um, <laughs> now this is a reality in the courts justice chalameshwar talks of trade offs within the collegium now who is to check this who is to check this one relative makes a killing in the other judges court the other relative makes a killing in this judges court and the third judge is a good friend of both these other judges and he is after all uncle to the lawyers concerned now can there be in this utopian because this is the level of utopia we can achieve can there be a check on this who is to interrogate these judges this is a very 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 legitimate question i'm glad you put it to all of us and we will of course do it i said in my observations um, i say it again that parliament has plenary powers to bring for a national collegium accepting that this particular act was not it how do you say that the why do you in a country of 1.3 billion uh prime minister says all the time and that i remember <laughs> and uh, the president 1.5 billion or something uh i don't know. but i i don't represent anyone i find it very difficult to i don't know what the meaning of the word represent but um, people know as so a 1.5 is why do we have only six members in court why do we have only 538 members of lok sabha and rajya sabha why is it amendment which freezes the uh, 70% amendment which freezes the population by pop an incentive to control population or a number of seats uttar pradesh and bihar would have why not we a parliament of 2000 people <laughs> who is laid down out of 1.5 billion people 2000 is what percent So why do I think there is possibility in Parliament to make a collegium of at least 50 members, or 30 members, or 15 members, why six? In which I would insist it should not be called whatever the rules and procedure may that the justice of all sectors shall not be convened. It cannot be. when you are dealing with constitutional for kamchari like process in the chief justice so kamila you to work, work out some method uh and you should keep 
primacy to the collegium, the small judges, whose views we normally respect, but they could be overcome by by a bit of majority opinion, certainly. So I would prefer a collegium system which is more perfect. I would say eminent person, the constitutional <coughs> amendment to lay down the criteria. I told to Sena Pagaro, Justice Sena Parari once, I said he was very angry with me. God bless him, by the way. He was very angry. He stopped talking with me. I said, that time Mother Teresa was alive. I said, Mother Teresa and Baba Amte should be a main person. There are two outstanding Indians that have been produced by India. See, what do we know about Sena Pagaro? said, what do we know about Chaki? I said, that's the point. They don't know a damn thing about lawyers and judges, but they know who is a good person, a good Indian, who cares for the poor and for the poor. So eminent persons, I agree, but not, not to be dominated by executive of the day. My goodness, I would not trust any political party in India today to nominate the eminent persons. But they don't see eminence when they see. They don't like eminence. Therefore, you don't know. I mean, the person and the procedure process. I'm saying parliament and its wisdom has the, can provide a collegium which is very different from the act that are passed, which finds a way to give some sort of primacy to the judges, increase the number of judges, but also finds a way to be really representative. Should I a South African constitution, South African court? People have to apply for that. The union person is part of the college. They are the commission. So there are a number of ways in which parliament can pass a reservoir. This was not it. But Professor, I think I still haven't got an answer to my question. <clears throat> now, you suggest that there can be a 50-member college. Let's take 50 as a figure with broad-based representation. But going by your theory of primacy, this 50-member collegium must still have 28 judges because primacy means not just significant chunk of representation but majority. And so whether it's a 5-member collegium or it's a 50-member collegium where the interests of judges are involved, the judges will still be in a majority. That's my difficulty. I suggest, I mean, offhand, I suggest all the, all the chief justices of the High Court. A five senior most, a six senior most judges of the Supreme Court is good enough judicial presence. But they have no veto power. Nobody should have veto power. They should decide either by unanimity or the majority. They, privacy is qualitative, not quantitative in my judgment. That you must have very good reason to reject what the judges say, who judges should not. But if you have good reasons, you must record them and override the judges. And that's where a, a, a armchair versus terrorism would come in all this, or the equivalence of them. I don't want to go into who are equivalent today, so there are very few. But in my time, there were plenty. Maybe there are plenty in this time also. Maybe a uh, Nobel, Nobel laureate we have produced one after Tagore. He can be. Uh, anybody can. I don't care. But uh, I think the eminent persons should be increased and should cover all strata of society. Um, I'm not sure if somebody made the point about transgender. There is a judgment on transgender also. And the judgment on gay, they contradict each other. So you can have a transgender person in the commission. I don't care whether it's gay or not gay. It is beyond gay, I think, in some, some way. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. But that apart, that apart, you can have a large commission which will decide, hopefully by unanimity, but always such a supremacy base can be found, but nobody shall ever be. And that can be done. That can be attempted. Uh, Madhvi, before you just comment, just building on this, I was just struck by the faith that both of you have in in the political process uh, to bring about uh, the social inclusivity and diversity. Uh, and I'm not saying that the judiciary is some 
uh, great uh, example of that. But I'm saying, the, I, for me, the faith on the other side also seems equally misplaced. And I think the problem of social inclusivity and diversity is more structural than uh, you know one organi one wing of the state being able to do it better than uh, another wing of the state. And and then, yeah. Okay, first of all, I think the, 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 the eminent persons are to be appointed by uh, not the executive, but by a com three member committee of the prime minister, the leader of the opposition, and the chief justice of India. That's important. Uh, so the chief justice of India has a say in the appoint had a say in the appointment of the eminent persons. Um, and, and if you know, we have chief election commissioners, we have um, uh, a CVC. Uh, all of these people are, you know, perfectly independent people. So why should we be so quickly, so cynical about who we can get? As far as qualifications are concerned, I think, you know, when we're talking about generally eminent persons from outside of the law, why should we restrict it? It may be, you know, a great filmmaker like a Satyajit Ray or, a, you know, I, I mean, it could be anybody. It, the discipline doesn't matter. I think just you, you just want somebody who's socially sensitive um, and, 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 and who would ensure that you get good people in. That's one. The, it, it, <laughs> well, it, it, you, if we have to trust our three top constitutional function, uh, functionaries, that's one. The second thing about, you know, so much was said about um, the basic structure and about primacy in the abstract. I think in this particular case, what it really boiled down to um, uh, uh, is whether what I call the right to insist by the judiciary, and I'll explain this. Because if the judges find on the, on the commission were to find that a particular candidate was an undesirable one, then they, they had that so-called veto with them, and two of them could simply uh, you know, block that appointment, and it would never happen. Therefore, no appointment on the commission could ever happen if the judges, if two out of three judges were to say no. That's number one. The only thing is that if the judges want a particular candidate, and two other members, whoever they are, were to say, you know, would to put their foot down and say no, uh, then perhaps it, it, it would not go through because that is a so-called veto which would be. Now, therefore, in the question is, in the light of objections by two other members, should the judges have the right to insist upon that appointment going through? Because presumably, if two other people have objections, it would be for good reasons because these are objections against a, a, a candidate who is recommended by or approved of by two other judges. So therefore what it boils down to is this right to uh, insist and that is not part of primacy as explained in the second judge's case because the second judge's case says that the prim primacy is an appointment, not in non-appointment. So you can prevent, the judges can prevent a bad egg from coming in but if somebody else were to object to their appointee, then perhaps they wouldn't be able to push him through. And as far as, again, the veto is concerned, one way of looking at it is a veto of two, you know, two out of six. But the other way of looking at it, it's a, it's a special majority of um, five is to six. That's what it boils down to, because you have to have five saying yes for it to go through. So that is, you know, the other way of looking at it. Yeah, thanks. I just want to address your question about faith in the political class yeah. and the political process, which you seem to imply is something naive. No, On our, no that's the <laughs> implication. You think it's a very touching faith. Now, yeah. I'll give only one reason why. When civil liberties were in danger, were taken away in our country during the emergency. It was the political class and the political process which restored those civil liberties to us, not the judiciary. Well, Ms. Ramkandar, is, is there? And this is my last question and yeah. you can have a reply and you can go to audience questions. But is there any point in 
we can stack up examples on either side, right? Uh, where the judiciary has saved the day and where parliament has saved the day. But I was wondering if what something that Professor Bakshi wrote in Indian Express about, there's a need to distinguish between constitutional politics in that sense, which I don't think we should have a problem with, between institutions uh, playing out the kind of constitutional politics, as opposed to something like a party politics. That there's no, that, that there's no constitutional purpose served in that sense. So viewing this uh, as some sort of self-serving uh, party politics, power brokering kind of framework. I'm glad you mentioned this because I come, that's where I come from. Now, it is convenient to think of this amendment as coming from this particular government, which so many of us, me included, let me reiterate my position, I am as uncomfortable as so many others are about the future of the idea of India under this government. But we have to discuss it at a constitutional plane, <clears throat> on a constitutional plane, in terms of constitutional theory, in terms of political theory. And that is why I take the stand that this particular judgment, the effect of this particular judgment is completely anti-democratic. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we have about 20 minutes for questions before we are asked to vacate the auditorium. Uh, so yeah, uh, if uh, if we can have uh, short questions, very quick questions, we can take as many. Uh, if we have two questions, we can start with two questions here in the front. Uh, whereas I hold no brief for the present government or any government for it. When the judges are appointed in a high court by the Collegium, there is a long assembly lineage of judges who will be chief justices and some of them will go come to the Supreme Court. So when they become chief justices, they are very good. But when they come to the gates of the Supreme Court, some of them are good, some of them, some of them are not. So the Collegium will look at their face and say, you come in and you don't come in. I believe there is any danger to the independence of the judiciary, it is from the judiciary itself. So how do you correct the system? Collegium or non-collegium is not the issue. Ni neither NJ is the issue. Now, the country is looking at a system which will inspire confidence in the people that, that you have a judiciary which will give you fair justice. That's the issue. Uh, it, it would be great if you would also just introduce yourself. That, okay. that was Professor Adbi saying, uh, Vice Chancellor of National University, Delhi. Yeah, I'm Mukul Mukul. I have a caveat to put. I was the advocate on record for the Advocates on Record Association <laughs> in the second judge's case. But what I'd like to say is, what Mr. Ramchandran said about uh, independence of judiciary protection from executive excesses. There has to be a protection on independence of judiciary from the collegium excesses also which is very well reflected yeah. in the judgments of Justice Joseph and Justice Chalmeshwar. We know judges who have not given a single judgment have been appointed to the Supreme Court. We have judges who are perpetually late, if not absent from their seats, who have been appointed to the Supreme Court. And as Professor Zandi Singh says, that it is the most, one more important thing we'd like to point out, the independent of the judiciary, particularly the high courts, is affected by this seminar culture every weekend. So most of the seminars are wholly irrelevant and do not contribute anything to the growth of law. Mm -hmm. But Justice Mudgal, what you said is what was said in this recent case by some of the counsel, led by the Attorney General. One judge says, it was a vitriolic attack. <laughs> uh, any, more, any more questions? Yeah, there's a question there. Sir, my name is Prashant. I'm a lawyer. My question is to Dr. Bakshi. Sir, you have mentioned some names. 
who could be eminent persons. You have mentioned Baba Ante and the Mother Teresa. Do you feel that Kailash Satyarthi or Medha Patkar or Vandana Shiva or somebody like that, will they take away the judicial independence if they were members in the appointment commission? And these uh, uh, judges become members of collegium only by chance, by seniority. Do you trust them more than these uh, persons who have devoted their whole life for uh, uh, social justice? Uh, well, should I take one more question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, hello everybody, my name is Navneet and I am a student of law and my question is that in this debate of having uh, diversity in the appointment process and in the judiciary, uh, we are forgetting one of the instruments that is uh, mentioned in the constitution that is uh, article 124.3 of appointing law teachers as members of the judiciary. So, uh, in this debate, why haven't we been exposed to idea of uh, law teachers being appointed as judges? Then I say that, that beyond recall, successive presidents of India in Raisana Hills have looked through their telescope to find a jurist <laughs> and have not found one. Seventy years. I would not expect that to happen. The only person who really wanted to be a judge of the Supreme Court was my colleague uh, and deserved to be one, Pradeep Nakumar Tepas. And he died a very unhappy man because he was not, my judges borrowed from him, they never acknowledged him. Uh, many of us are interested in becoming judges. Were you ever That's considered? Irrelevant. Were you ever considered? No. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm, not I'm not made of the type with, a, with judges. Cases say that that's sort of this thing and that thing and that thing to a judge. I don't have those many qualities. I don't know whether any judge has those many qualities, but I don't. <laughs> so I'm not happy as a more teacher. But so that idea is dead, don't pursue it. It's like do it nowhere. Seventy years is good enough time to forget that idea. <laughs> constitution made a make obviously constitution makers made a mistake. And we should accept it. And not many presidents, also the chief justices, all these people. So there is now a consensus among the judicial and political class about the law teachers. So forget about it. The idea might be very good, but it is irrelevant. Now, um, on the. I am not concerned with giving out names, so will be, but certainly a, litig a technically a litigant includes a public interest petitioner. And therefore, there's some of the names to mention, however eminent, and I agree, they should be there on the college, may not become, because they are already uh, in one case or another, in which I'm helping them or not helping them. Uh, but we should find people who do nothing with the courts, or while, while they're in the courts, they have no case pending before any court in India. Therefore, the task is look out, in my opinion. On the question of, uh, I forgot most of the question, but on the question of what classes of people you trust, political classes <coughs> or judiciary, it very much depends on the context. I would not trust the political classes of any kind since independence till now to protect my liberties and rights. I said the good trusty judges. I would trust only classes for a variety of other things. Because competition for power in India has meant uh, very different things than competition for power means other democracies. Competition for power can reside in one fact, how to render citizens into subjects all over again, regardless of which. And when competition of power is directed to that end, I won't trust the political class to protect my rights and freedoms. I won't occasionally trust the judiciary. But what option do I have? I have to trust some institution. So judiciary is not my institution of choice, but of necessity. It is my institution that I trust as a citizen. On all other matters, I don't care. I, I trust the political classes or the business classes. I, you can trust your way, way, way back world. You, know, you can trust anybody you like. Uh, as for, 
poor me is concerned. I'm a small man, and the fact that I'm a small man is proved every day, every minute. Um, uh, I suppose that now in my youth, in my second youth. Uh, so it's all right, it does matter. You make your own choices. But I'm saying that you need to have as a citizen faith, ultimate faith, in the subaltern masses of India. And I'm basing your time and mine when I say this, because you people belong, like me, to upper middle class or middle middle classes. And you are not likely to give a second thought to the really impoverished people of India. But if you have time, and if you have some dollars for insulation, I request to you is, this is self auction. This has not, no meaning whether you trust judges or you trust foundations. When they, and don't, don't ever make the mistake when the chips are down. Courts are as much organs of governance as the state executive is. There is no difference. When the chips are down, even today, if you look at the so-called terror case, when the courts acquit a person after 14 years, 16 years, because the police is not produce, willing to produce, able to produce evidence after so many years. There are tons of cases. When the chips are down, when the security of, and the integrity of India is concerned, there is no difference between a police thana and the Supreme Court and the Prime Minister. When they feel the citizens are nowhere and their faith is irrelevant, they behave all the same way. You, you look at uh, Manorama and uh, uh, who has been raped by uh, uh, special um, police, yeah. Assam police forces. You look at the act, you look at Jivan Reddy, as Justice Jivan Reddy, my friend, uh, has said oh, why he should stay, it should be made more permanent. He went to Assam and uh, North Eastern states and he found that people, the main grievance was that the Asfa was only directed to North East. So he said, oh, that's very good, we, we should generalize it to communal disturbances action. So his idea is to apply to all of India, so that his people would not have any grievance that is applied to them. And that's what he did, proposed, and then began the law in the early regime. So, my friend, if you are really concerned with people at the bottom, you will do very different things than devote your time to what judiciary or political class into. But if you are concerned with yourself, and uh, your likes. Yes, this is a very important debate. And uh, I hope I have uh, uh, contributed some misleading and mysterious things to it. Uh, can we have the last set of three questions? Uh, if you can take the, uh, the person there uh, and uh, the two people sitting at the back. Uh, good evening, sir. My name is Ankit Sharma. I'm an advocate at the Bombay High Court. Uh, my question is to Mr. Ramachandran. Uh, the f question pertaining to the relevant social philosophy. Now we have something like a civil service neutrality for the civil servants. In the same scenario, analogous, do we have any neutrality when it comes to appointment of judges according to the constitution? Uh, pertaining to that also is the question, does the social philosophy of the judge sacrifice on the merits of the cases he decides. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question for Ms. Devan. You uh, rightly pointed out that the NGAC provides for social diversity and you also said that uh, in Australia homo social reproduction has been studied that the judges like to see those people uh, as uh, uh, like to appoint those people who share their social philosophy. You gave an illustrative example that a uh, black woman may feel that she will not get justice from an all-white bench in South Africa. But don't you think that the problem with this narrative is that it uh, presumes that all social groups are monolithic communities and judges from the same social groups may have will have the same social philosophies. For example, in United States, uh, Ken Anthony Kennedy and Andrew Scalia are both Catholics. But on controversial issues like marriage equality and abortion, they differ greatly from each other. So how would you respond to that? Let me take the last question. Hi, my name is Gaurav and I'm a student of law. 
Uh, my question is, uh, would, do you see this NJAC verdict uh, of the Supreme Court as a sort of, uh, 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 as an anomaly? Because usually what happens is, if, if, if you go back to 2005, in the case of uh, beef ban, uh, Supreme Court very easily just gets swayed by the arguments of the state and such flimsy arguments like only a handful of like five, two percent of people are, would be affected so you can compromise on the fundamental rights of those people. Uh, so it's like when the fun, so-called fundamental rights of Supreme Court are sort of compromised then they, are, they, they stand against the, uh, the government but otherwise they are almost playing hand to hand with the st state. Thanks. Uh, let me address the social philosophy question. Now first, civil service neutrality which you talked about. My understanding of civil service neutrality is that you shouldn't be partisan to one political master, which means a civil servant should not be a BJP guy, he should not be a Congress guy. But civil service neutrality doesn't mean that you are not in tune with the ideals of the Constitution, with fundamental rights, with directive principles. The difference between a good bureaucrat and a bad bureaucrat is this. A good bureaucrat is one who doesn't bow to a political master except in the chain of command, but is in tune with the ideals of our Constitution. So equally, in the judicial sphere, Neutrality must be seen in this context. When our constitution, like all constitutions, is a social document, judges are not deciding cases as if they are deciding a civil suit, where they only have to assess the evidence and apply the law. I have often given this example of a former Chief Justice of India who retired not very long ago, who writes in a judgment on reservations that reservation itself implies mediocrity. Now, a judge who is sworn to uphold the Constitution, a Constitution which has affirmative action written in it, if he has this inborn bias against reservation, because our Constitution contemplates not just affirmative action generally, but reservation is part of our constitutional scheme. If a judge is not in tune with this scheme, he certainly needs to be interrogated on it. So the point which I am trying to make is, for a constitutional court, social philosophy and being in tune with the ideals of the constitution is a must. Uh, yeah, those two questions at the back. Uh, one, uh, on this uh, aspect of social diversity, uh, of course, this was not to suggest that uh, if, if there is a South African bench of all white men, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily mean, number one, that they will not do justice, uh, nor does it mean that they share the same social philosophy. Uh, the idea of um, having diversity on the bench is to inspire public confidence that this is a, 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 a bench, a, a court, which represents society and even though my case may land up, if I am a black woman and my case lands up with before a white judge, I feel that ultimately this, this court itself overall is, is representative of society and of not just you know, one class of people. And the, the studies in Australia showed this, it's called uh, uh, either judicial cloning or homosocial reproduction that and unwittingly and com acting completely bona fide, if a judge were to, you know, uh, uh, be required to suggest names for appointment, he may be likely to look at somebody in his own, you know, his own image. He wa may want to perpetuate that without meaning any harm at all. So the idea is 
under this system it was at least to try and uh, widen the net so that you 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 at least you are able to reach out to many more people because under the collegium the grievance was that you are only looking at those you know somebody you know somebody mentions that so and so is a good candidate he or she is practicing in such and such court etc so therefore the net is cast very um, you know uh, 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 not wide enough and therefore there may be people for example practicing in a, a district judge somewhere now the high court chief suppose that you know someone practicing in in the uh, uh, some fla far flung area of maharashtra and the high court uh, the chief justice of the bombay high court may not even know this person you know so therefore how is how are you know to widen the net is is uh, uh, the whole object of this process and the second question um, on um, you know the idea was and the attempt was uh, to refer them have the matter referred to a larger bench because um, you know one we knew that given the fact that the nine judges the second judges case stood in the way of uh, um, uh, you know the, the, uh, a bench of five judges and 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 secondly also because the doctor you know it was ultimately the judges deciding on their own powers so to that extent there was an inevitable conflict but the doctrine of necessity requires that it is heard by the judges but therefore the 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 attempt was to try and get it referred to as large a bench as possible so that at least in the public's mind also there is that much more confidence that and, and for, to give you one example in in uh, in pakistan a similar thing happened and they referred it to their full bench of i think 17 judges so you know that itself was very symbolic if i may just quickly uh, respond i think that on the diversity question uh, the the idea is not as much uh, to represent uh, ideas on the bench it's not to say that uh, a, sh a scheduled caste woman on the bench is the best representative uh, for the ideas or benefits of scheduled caste women i don't think that's the idea i don't think you can ever ensure that right but the question is of presence right as as mr var was saying that it's it's that distinction between the politics of ideas that why can't why can't you obviously wouldn't make the argument that uh, uh men can represent the interests of women just as well in let's say in parliament right so the question is not of how well will they further the interest of that group i don't think that it's about the presence and and of course deference is concerned uh, i think it's it's a very problematic area for constitutional jurisprudence uh that courts have never really uh developed any theory of deference in which situations will they defer in which situations will they not defer now if you look at situations where there is uh the maximum infraction on rights courts like national security laws courts seem to be extremely deferential right uh, whereas in so many other contexts courts are so much more interventionist uh and clearly uh that connection between degree of uh, infraction of rights and the degree of uh, uh, deference has not been made and it seems to be uh, anyone's game in uh, as far as uh, that's concerned uh, anybody any more uh, comments okay um on that note uh, uh, thank you very much uh, and thank you all of you for staying back this long uh, right uh now of course it wouldn't be complete without me thanking uh the students who run uh the public law and policy dis discussion group uh they have dealt with uh issues ranging from the absolutely inane uh to the profound in getting this done uh and it'd be surprising how inane the inane got uh uh but anyway thank you so much to all of you uh, a wonderful effort and we hope we can do more of these things and of course this these issues are evolving these constitutional dynamics are evolving and on, and on on that note of evolution we have a copy of of the rather controversial book uh, the south african gandhi the stretcher bearer of empire uh, of uh, for each of you uh, and i'm from just request uh, <laughs> siddharth to give a copy each uh, uh, yeah
Thank you so much, everyone, and good night. Thank you.